All right, guys, we get started this evening. Do we have any prayer requests this evening? Any prayer requests? Did the swelling go down? Okay. Oh. Good. Anyone else? So they're in the Bering Sea. All right. So they're going to be in episode 12 or something. We'll be looking for them. We'll be looking for them. All right. Who else? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you, dear Lord, for all the things that you do in our lives and all the things that you give us opportunity for. And dear Father, we thank you for loving us the way that you do. And we do lift up uh, my sister's son, dear, fo dear father, a very, very, very dangerous job. And we just ask you to watch over them, dear father, him, the captain, the crew, and that they'd be able to come home safely to their families. We do lift them up. We do continue lifting up to you. Pat, dear Lord, thank you for the good report and that his pain level is down. And we just ask you to continue watching over him in this situation, dear Lord. And for other individuals, Father, that are not doing well, some have cancer and some are struggling with different illnesses, we just lift each and every one of them up to you. You may be glorified in every situation and that a witness may be given, dear Lord, on behalf of every situation may bring you glory. We thank you now, dear Lord, for the many blessings. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. Father, we thank you for all these things, for so many more, and we thank you in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me take your Bible and turn to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis chapter 6. While you turn to the book of Genesis, Father's Day is coming up. Father's Day is coming up, so that's going to be on Sunday the 17th, 16th, is, is it the 16th, 16th, okay, it's going to be on the 16th, so ahead of time, happy Father's Day, fathers, so I want you to turn in your book, in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, book of Genesis, uh, I want you, to, as you're looking at this very, very well-known portion of Scripture, when I first got saved, as many other individuals, uh, never held the Bible in my hand, uh, guess where I began reading? Genesis. I began, I thought it was just like any other book, you read from the beginning and just take off from there. And so this was one of the first stories that just kind of I, I'd heard about, and it just, it floored me. It floored me when I started reading it. But I want you to notice something. When you look at this individual by the name of Noah, Name, this individual, everybody here knows Noah. Notice what the Bible says beginning in chapter 6. And notice what it says beginning with verse 8. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his, in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Notice when you look at this portion of Scripture, there's a few things I want you to notice. First of all, the, this individual by the name of Noah, this individual by the name of Noah, at a very, very difficult time, at a very, very difficult time, as a matter of fact, the destruction of the world by flood, if you would, or by water. And when that is about to occur, Noah still has three children. He has three sons, and they have wives, and he has his wife. So it's a total of eight of them, eight individuals. And I want you to notice the very first thing. The Bible says in verse 9, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Notice this, notice this characteristic. And it says, and Noah walked with God. It says, Noah walked with God. When you see that and you notice the situation, it's talking about he had a relationship with God. He had a relationship, and obviously it was one where he was communing with God. Notice a few things that it says about the verse 11. 
the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. At a time, at a time of great difficulty, the condition, the Bible says it was corrupt. The Bible says all flesh had sinned. It said it was wicked. It was filled with violence. Well, it sounds familiar, don't it? I mean, at a time that there was nothing but violence, it was corrupt. The Bible says Noah walked with God. It says he was a righteous man. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, we have every reason in the world, every condition in the world to say, boy, it's so hard. It is so difficult. It is so difficult to be a father. It is, I got to tell you, in the neighborhood I grew up in, there was three of us. Uh, there's more people, but the guys I grew up with, uh, my limited sphere, there was three friends I had. We played baseball together and all the above when I was a little boy. Do you know only, there's only three of us that had our fathers. Everybody else had the uncle of the week. And that was, my, that was my neighborhood. Individuals came and went. I mean, all of a sudden you see this guy there, and next week it's another guy and another guy. You know, I was very blessed. I remember we were playing a, a baseball game. We played in a place called Universal Little League. And my dad never came to, to watch me play. My dad would work at nights. My dad was always working. My dad was a workaholic. And so, but one time my dad showed up. And when he showed up, he came over, and he bought all my team snow cones. It was like the little cone thing like this and the ice and I was so proud and everybody's looking at me and says man it must be great to have a dad I never thought about that I was very fortunate now my dad uh, my dad was a good father a, uh, I would say a great dad not a very good husband but he was a great dad and so that's what I remember growing up but nevertheless when he got old and you know I had a really good relationship with my dad I remember always telling him and then my mother, thank you for never leaving us because it seemed like everybody else got left. Everybody else, times got hard. There wasn't any money. There was all these excuses and all these men. They had all these kids and all of a sudden just took off. You've heard the old adage, easiest thing in the world is to have kids. The hardest thing in the world is to raise them. I mean, anybody can have kids, but raising them and staying with them and being part of their lives, that takes, that takes a man. And I want you to notice Noah Noah was an individual under harsh conditions, under harsh conditions, he walked with God. But notice something else about Noah. The Bible says that in this portion of scripture, not only do you see the conditions that he was under, it says that it was corrupt. And notice this, it says that the Lord, what he did is he said, I am going to keep my covenant with you. Verse, thir ver verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark thou and thy sons thy wife thy sons wives with thee and i want you to hold your thought to that because we'll close with that you know he made a covenant with him the bible says that he was there and he was there at a very very corrupt time the conditions were deplorable if you would but nevertheless god made a covenant with him isn't that a beautiful thing god makes covenants with men god makes covenants with us what does that mean what it means is God enters into a relationship with us, and the main thing is not conditional upon Noah, it's conditional upon God. God's the one that keeps his word, because we're not very good at keeping our word to God. God is very good about keeping his word to himself and to us. The Bible says something else. Notice that Noah, at a very, very difficult time, being a father, he was an individual that walked with God. Look at what the Bible says in verse 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So did he. Now, notice the Bible, if you would, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and listen to this, this portion of Scripture. The Bible says in verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The Bible says, that describes him in the book of 2 Peter, a preacher of righteousness. Notice this, not only did Noah walk with God, Noah gave witness of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, the worst, statistically speaking, the worst preacher in the entire Old Testament, according to statistics, is Noah. Preached for over 100 years and only his family came to the Lord. The best preacher, statistically speaking, would be Jonah. Everybody repented, and Jonah couldn't stand him. 
It's pretty funny because if you look at it and if you study it, the interesting thing is what Noah did is he preached and he was faithful in preaching and yet, and yet, only his family came into the ark with him. You know, that's a great, great story introduction to the, to the understanding of the gospel. The gospel is not the joy of people being saved. The gospel is the joy of the opportunity to share the gospel. Salvation belongs to God, and we rejoice in it. But we should rejoice just as much whenever we give witness. I was with a, with a family Tuesday. We went to see a family. I went to see a family this man has cancer all over his body. I mean, this man, he's not going to be alive very long. Not, not alive very long. And a sister asked me to go see him. So I went to go see him, and I was there with him. 72 years old and riddled with cancer. I mean, it is, he cannot drink a, a, this much Ensure without vomiting everything out. Anything that he takes in, it's going to come out. He has esophageal cancer, has lung cancer. It is now metastasized to the liver. It, it, it's just horrific. So I'm sitting there and I was like, I got a question to ask you, man. And he says, well, I'm going to try and get better. I said, that's not my question. The question is, if you were to die today, where would you go? And he looked at me and he said, I guess I better give that some thought because I'm getting ready to die. I said, yeah, you are. And so anyway, we talked about it and we shared the gospel. Listen, I was joyful that I was able to share the gospel. He kept, every time he just kept looking at his wife, kept looking at his wife. And every time he was looking at his wife, uh, later on he told me why. He said, Preacher, this isn't the first time we've heard the gospel. We, we've heard the gospel many times before, and every time we rejected it. Out of his own mouth. Well, he didn't reject it again, so thank God for that. But he, just, he said, we just kept rejecting it. And you know what was going on in his life? He was thinking about it, and he was thinking to himself, all the years that I lost, that I could have been serving God. Yeah, that's, that, that's just heartbreaking. Thank God he came to the Lord. But at the same time, all those years that he didn't serve the Lord. You see, the Bible says about Noah that he walked with God, but it says that he gave witness of God. Preacher of righteousness. This man preached when no one was listening. This man preached when no one wanted to make a decision. This man preached when individuals just kept, I'm sure made fun of him, when individuals just came by and he just kept, on building just kept on hammering just kept putting the thing together and continued giving a witness i mean isn't that what we're called to do in spite of whatever the world thinks of the world says there is a christ there is not a christ they accept they reject or they don't want to have anything to do or organized religion has come upon every it doesn't matter it, it doesn't matter we were never sent to save anyone we were sent to give witness that's what we were sent for and so therefore the bible says of noah that's exactly what he did. I want you to notice the final thing. I want you to take a look at this for just a moment. About my Father's Day, right? And I started just going through the Bible. I would challenge you to do the same thing. Go through the Bible and look at the father figures in the Bible. Look at all the fathers in the, in the Bible and their characteristics. What was it about them that made them fathers? Uh, by the way, there's a great distinction. A father and a dad are two different things. We got a lot of fathers. They're donors. There's a lot of fathers, not a whole lot of dads. The dad is the one that shows up when nobody else shows up. He's the one that listens. He's the one that has to sometimes bring discipline. He's the one that sometimes has to bring whatever it may be. But a dad is just different. A dad is different. I would say that this individual was different. Noah was different. And so he's an individual that walked with God. He's an individual, I want you to notice, that gave witness of God but this is real important. I want you to see this with me, if you would. The Bible says in chapter 7, I want to read down to this. It says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen, in, for, I, uh, for have I seen righteous before me in this generation. I, I, I've seen you, Noah. I've seen your life. I've seen the way you are. Of every clean beast thou shalt take of thee by sevens, the male, his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters 
was upon the earth. By the way, something else that happened when the floodwaters came is his relative Methuselah passed away. And Methuselah is the individual that has lived the longest, right? He's the guy that lived the longest time on the earth. But there's something else about Methuselah. Methuselah, his name means when he dies, it shall come. The day, he, the day that he shut his eyes to this world, here come the waters. And so the Bible says of Noah, but I want you to notice this with me. This is so important. So Noah's an individual that walks with God. He's an individual that gives witness of God. But the third thing I want you to notice is this, and most importantly, Noah won his family. Noah won his family. Look at verse 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wife and his wife uh, his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Notice carefully what the Bible says. It says, Noah went in his sons and his wife, his sons' wives with him. With him, not with them. With him. So what in the world does that mean? If you put the order together, I want you to notice what happened. When the, when the ark was complete, Methuselah dies, Noah walks, and they follow him. That's so important. That's so important because a father has always been designed to lead his family, not to follow them, to lead them. Families follow them. They don't do it otherwise. It's the tail wagging the head. You see, what happens is a lot of times you have, we have, listen, we have our, our uh, if you would, our communities, our civilization, if you would, it's changed a lot. Things have changed. Things have drastically changed. And what we've done is we've made adjustments to it. And the adjustments we've made is, okay, well, we have to make adjustments. And all the adjustments that we're making, it's because, well, the world has changed. The world might have changed, but there's a lot of things that haven't changed from the Lord. There's a lot of things that haven't changed from the Lord. And the very first thing was God, didn't, God made them man and woman. He made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And so what he did was he made a male and female. And what he did was he had an intention. And the intention is, I want you to lead. In this portion of scripture, the Bible says, Noah walks in. Isn't this crazy? He walks in and they all walk in with him. That means his wife, the first person, and then it says his daughter-in-laws and his sons. They came behind Noah. They followed Noah. The interesting thing is individuals will follow when they're led. Individuals will scatter when they're not led. So I got to tell you something. Children were never given the responsibility to lead the home. And in many a home, children lead it because of their tantrums, because they don't have any understanding, and because we make adjustments. Secondly, there's a lot of homes now in which women have become women and men because there is no man alive. There's no man in the house. Or there might be different men. And the different men that keep coming, well, what happens is children don't know who to obey or who to watch or who to follow. And so we have all this, same situations have occurred. I got to tell you something, my, my, uh, I got to tell you something about my dad. So when my dad married my mom, my mother already had my brother. Now this is in the 50s, imagine. And my mother was the baby. She was the youngest of 15. And so my mom is the baby. She's the little prize child, whatever. And my mother has my brother Reuben when she was 22 years old. And then my mother was 24 years old when she met, uh, uh, actually she got pregnant at 22. She had him at close to 23. And so she met my dad. My dad was 17 years old. Can you imagine? My dad was 17. My mom was 24. And my mom already had my brother Reuben. Now, my mom is a little bit darker skinned than I am. My dad's real light skinned. My brother, my brother's about this tall. Well, not anymore. Now that he's older, he's about right here now. But my brother used to be this tall. My brother's real light skinned, light brown hair. And you can tell we're brothers, but you can tell... There's a little difference between us, but that's my brother. Let me tell you something special about my dad. My dad at 17 took my brother. He took my brother when my brother was uh, almost two years old. I lived in that house all my life, and my dad never treated my brother any differently than he treated the rest. I got to tell you something, that's a special man. That's a, and you know, when my, when my brother got older, his... his uh, biological father wanted to come look for him. 
my brother's like, I have my dad. You're not my dad. No, 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 I'm your dad. I'm, I'm not, you're not my dad. That's my dad. And my brother, all the days of his life, till we buried my dad, my brother's, still, my brother's now uh, 69 years old, he always claimed that my dad was his dad. You know why? Because my dad raised him. My dad loved him. My dad took care of him. You know what my brother called my dad? Dad. You know what my dad called him? Son. Ne I can, and I can tell you the God honest truth. I'm my father's only biological son. I'm the only son he has. He has three daughters, adopted Reuben and myself, and then adopted a grandson, Robert. But I'm the only son that he has. I'm going to tell you something funny. I have a nephew. Uh, he's a nephew. But my mother, my mother adopted him legally. So by law, or by blood, he's my nephew. But by law, he's my brother. So because my mother took him away from my sister because she was wild and crazy. And so she said, no, you're not going to be bringing him, taking him. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. So my mom, she got an attorney. She had her sign papers, and he became hers. And so I have a little brother. 44, that's not little, dear God, I'm old. Anyway, I have a 44-year-old brother, I have a 69-year-old. I can tell you this, my dad saw this one, this one, and that one, all the same, all the same. You know, I have a lot of respect for my dad. I have a lot of respect for men that take someone else's and raise them as their own. Not everybody has that type of love and heart. Those men are rare. Those men are priceless. Those men are jewels. By the way, those women that do that are just as rare and just as appreciated. So I, lo I, I love the thought and I love thinking about how it was that my dad took this guy. And my dad raised my brother, whipped him the way he whipped the rest of us, played ball with him the way he played ball with the rest of us, and put him to work the way he put the rest of us to work. No difference. When I look at Noah, let me tell you what Noah did. He led his family. We're going to see a lot of that Sunday. He led his family. He was responsible. And if you look at the Bible, God made him responsible. And when he made him responsible, guess what he did? This individual won his family. There's a lot in ministry. There's a lot of things that are important. Church is important. The work of the Lord is important. But I'll tell you the God honest truth. You never put the ministry or anything else in front of your family. Because when you, listen, I, I'm around dying people all the time. And guess who always shows up when someone's dying? Guess who shows up? I've, I've been around a lot of preachers that are dying. Guess who shows up? Maybe one or two old friends, but family. Family. That's who shows up. Family. To everybody. It's family. And the family is going to remember and they're going to adjust to whatever life they had and they are going to be either very grateful or they're going to be very upset or they're going to feel nothing at the death of someone the father is a key instrument and element in the home the father is so vital he is so important the bible says that he won his family let me tell you something else when i first started out i, I say this all the time I used to be the best preacher on the family until my kids grew up. <laughs> then all of a sudden, I was like, wow. <laughs> I have a daughter. Every one of you would want her as a daughter. Straight A student, did everything she was told. Just Then I had a son, and it was totally opposite. But I got to tell you something about that situation. Do you know when I was in church, when I was in church, I always wanted my son to behave. I wanted him to do the right thing. Now, here's the truth. I've said this many times. I've said it in front of him. I didn't want him to behave and do the right thing because it was the right thing. It's because it made me look bad. That's the truth. That is the truth. Was it a good thing or right? It was wrong. But there was always this pressure in church where you had to look right. You had to act right. You had to always seem like you had all things going on. To, you could never act or be like you were having trouble. Because then you always felt like folks were looking. So that's the way it was with my son had to do exactly what I. You know, I talked to my son years, years later when he was a 
man. Do you know that when I was in church, it was knocking on doors, going to people, preaching, leading people to the Lord. Our church grew exponentially. And I, what my son told me was this, broke my heart, man, broke my heart, because blindsided, right? Sometimes you don't see what's right in front of you. And I'm so, I'm so stupid, I'd rather just be honest about it. But you know what was funny? My son told me this. My son told me years ago. He said, Dad, when I did what you told me to do and I was just at home, you were always busy caring, seeking, nurturing, discipling people that were problematic. But guess what he figured out? My dad goes to problematic people. But guess what my son did? He became problematic. And in being problematic, it's like, well, I guess I'll get some attention now. And that's what he did. And I, I, I want to, I'm closing a little bit early, but I, I want to tell you something. That I, I tell this story. I've told this story to my son. We've repeated it so many times. I was in school. I was working warehouse jobs. I was cooking for a family. And just, it was like this. Just, man. Never a day off. Never. It was just go, go, go. And I was pastoring a church. It was just crazy. And I remember one day, I told Daniel, I said, uh, come here. So he came over. It was a Thursday night. And I said, uh, tomorrow belongs to you. What? We had just put up a basketball goal. And I said, tomorrow belongs to you. Uh, Dad, you're not. I took the day off. I don't have classes. I don't have anything. Tomorrow is your. You know, all night long, all night long in his bedroom, he kept dribbling that basketball. I think he was envisioning having, you know, a game with his dad, playing with his, I don't know what he was thinking, but I know what he was, I know one thing he was thinking is, I get to have my dad all day tomorrow to myself. And so I'm there, and I remember we went outside, boy, we shot basketball, we snacked, we wrestled on the grass, we, I told him stories of when I was a kid, we were just laughing. Then the phone rang. The phone rang, it's a family that was problematic. Always problematic. Think they, they thought they knew more than everybody else, but problematic. Their life was nothing but problems. Once again, here comes the call. We need you to come over right now because she's running away and, and she's with a new guy and this and that. and Same problem again. And this is what I remember. I had a, a Honda Accord, a four-door Honda Accord, no air condition, one radio station. That was my car. It's standard. And I remember driving away, looking in the rearview mirror, and Daniel's holding a basketball, just staring at me, drive away. You know, that family never supported, never did nothing other than cause problems. They never did. And then when they left that church, they did the same thing, another one, did the same thing, another one. And that's what I would go chasing after, to try and be a help. And the whole time in the rearview mirror of my life, I'm seeing my son. And then the struggles began. And nobody, nobody showed up at 3 o'clock in the morning when he hadn't been home. Nobody showed up when I was laying there crying my eyes out. Where's my son? Is he dead? Is he alive? Nobody showed up. So the number one prerogative in our lives as fathers is our families. Families first. You take care of that family God gave you. You labor over that family. You love over that family. And the family is the main thing. Because if God gave them to you, it's, he did that for a reason. And that's the main, that's your congregation. That is your congregation. Then after that, you know, of course, we serve God. We serve God alongside it. And we teach them to love the Lord. We teach them to serve the Lord. But we teach them walking along. I wish somebody would have told me that a long time ago. Uh, I remember telling, I remember telling uh, Brother Mike, I was a young preacher. I, I I needed help. And I'm like, where do I go? Where do I? So there was a pastor's conference. Man, I was so excited. There was going to be teaching. There was going to be instruction. There was, man, I needed it. I went over there. I've never walked away so depressed and so discouraged. Everybody there, their kids were valedictorians. Everybody there, their kids walked perfectly. Everybody there, they had their own homes. They had their own cars. They, I'm sitting there going, I have a Honda Accord that I never know when it's going to break down. I live at the parsonage of the church. I don't have my own home. Man, I'm struggling with my boy. I must be doing something wrong. 
And I just walked away thinking, gosh. Later on, I met their families, these valedictorians. Yeah, crackheads, individuals that were on the streets. Yeah, boy, when did they graduate, valedictorian? What I found out is everybody was so busy trying to impress everybody with what they weren't, we just became nothing. I think that's why the world started walking away from the church, because they started seeing something different. All they want to see is the same thing. That's all. That's all they want to see. And so I'm awful grateful for this guy. I'm grateful for Noah, because Noah sets out a very simple thing. Think about it. Noah walked with God. Noah gave witness of God. Noah won his family. Period. Closing of the ark. When they hit dry land, guess who came out of the ark? Sham, Shem, Japheth. Three wives, his wife, his family. I'm pretty sure that he mourned the loss of all of his friends and individuals that did not come in. But I bet he was awful thankful when he looked and he saw his family there. I think that's the main goal, isn't it? I look forward to the day that I go to be with the Lord. I look forward to seeing my dad. And I'm so grateful, and my mom, but I'm so grateful for the ability of having witness to him. Somebody witnessed to me, and I was able to witness to them. and They were able to come to the Lord. I'm so grateful for that. Tuesday, Tuesday uh, I'm headed to, uh, to Houston, and uh, we're going to bury my friend and uh, do a graveside service as well. And so about 1 o'clock. And I'll tell you what, that's, uh, I don't know, I don't, everybody thinks differently. I have four men in my life that I have trusted, and I, I trust them with my lives. My father was one. Pastor Ken Kelly was another one. Bill Bohannon is another one. Mike Luhan is the other one. Mike Luhan is the only one left. Uh, these guys walked with me. I walked with them wept with them and all the above. It's a, it's, it's a very stirring thing. You know what I found out about burying Bill? And life is short. Life is so darn short. And it's too short. The best thing to do is enjoy the Lord. Enjoy your family. Enjoy everything that God has given unto you. Every day. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Whatever it is that comes into our lives, that we would be able to see it because everything in life wants to rob you of joy. Everything in life wants to distract you away from joy. Everything in life wants to do that. Life's too short. Life is way too short. So this Father's Day, uh, to those of you that still have your dads, those of you that still have your dads, boy, just be so grateful for that. Those of you that don't, don't you think about them and remember them. What's the greatest thing you learn from them? It's the greatest thing they taught you. It's the greatest thing they worked to you. And it was so fast, wasn't it? It was so fast. I can't believe my, my dad's. I always thought my dad would be living with me and be old. And he never had the chance. So whenever it is that I see individuals that still have their, their dads, and love on your dad. Love on them as much as you can. Might not be perfect rascals, but nevertheless, they're your dad. And if you still have them, praise the Lord. If you don't, remember them. Remember who they were and what they were and what they did. How they drank coffee. How they put on their shoes. How they griped. Or how they did whatever. What was their favorite show? And uh, I was thinking, I, I don't know why I'm being nostalgic, but I'm thinking of my dad. My dad was funny. My dad was hilarious. And my dad was born poor. He was my dad never wanted to pay money for a belt. He never wanted to pay money for a belt. We'd tell him, Dad, let me buy you a belt. No, 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 they're too expensive. They're too expensive. And so he came to, he came to San Antonio. I close with this. He came to San Antonio. Mike Luhan loved my dad, and my dad loved Mike Luhan. So my dad was the kind of guy when he wanted to buy something, he would get a can, a coffee can, and he'd put quarters and dimes and and he would save up, and then when he had the money, then he'd buy whatever it was, you know. He, he, he didn't like debt, and so he would save, 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 save. Then when he had the money, he'd buy it. 
So anyway, I saw him with the can. I'm like, what you doing with the can? And he says, I have $45. For what? I'm, I need to buy a good pair of shoes, some hush puppies. I'm like, but they don't make hush puppies anymore. And he's like, well, $45, I'm going to get a great pair of sh diabetic shoes. And I'm thinking to myself, that would cost more than that. So anyway, we came to SAS Shoes here in San Antonio and went to the old one there on the south side. And so there's Mike Luhan. Mike meets my dad. And he takes my dad off. They go. And he goes and gets some shoes. My dad had nails like an armadillo. Big thing. Boy, when my dad was cutting his nails, you better put on goggles or something, because if those things are flying, they'll cut your throat, you know. So my dad's there, and, you know, he never, my dad never had a great pair of shoes. He, uh, he just got whatever could be afforded, which wasn't much. And so he said, I'm going to splurge, and I'm going to spend $45 for a great pair of shoes. And so he goes, and then Mike's with him, and he goes, and he finds some like Velcro, where he doesn't, because my dad couldn't feel his hands anymore. He had heart. And so he goes and he finds a pair of shoes, wide, comfortable, and the Velcro. And he, my dad's like, wow. Never knew shoes could be this kind. He was so excited. And he said, man, these are. And so then he turns around, $240. So he looks at, no, I don't need them. I, that's okay. That's, you know, that's my dad. I'm not. And Mike's like, no, 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 they're on me. He goes, no, Mike, no, I'm not letting you. And Mike said, you're going to break my heart if you don't let me buy you these shoes. He's looking at him. And so he, he bought him that pair of shoes. Then he took him over to Penner's and he bought him two guayaberas. Uh, you know, Mike did that. And so my dad was just, so when, we, when he passed away, before, when he was, before he died, he had a blue one. And he says, I want you to bury me in the one that Mikey gave me. And so that's the blue shirt we put on him, and that's the one. I kept the red one, so I have it there. It reminds me of my dad. And so I tell Mike, I tell Mike, Mike just, because there was so much stuff going on, I said, Mike, just keep everybody away from me. I just, because I was preaching, my dad's funeral was hard enough. And so I start talking about my dad, and Mike's sitting right in front. And Mike starts listening to the stories. He start, Mike starts Then he, here come, he just starts a bawling like crazy. And so everybody came over, everybody in the crowd, because everybody knew Mike, everybody knew my dad. Everybody comes over and starts consoling Mike. <laughs> and he said, well, I kept them away from you, didn't I? <laughs> you know, friends like that and my dad, by the way, I still have those shoes. Uh, don't wear them or anything like that, but I just... I just have them, still have them. And every once in a while, every once in a while, whenever I miss the old man a lot, I go look for the shoes, put them on, and I sit outside and have a conversation with him. About nothing, dumb things. You have your dad enjoy them. If you're a dad, enjoy your kids. Enjoy them while you have them. Because they'll grow up before you know it. They'll grow up so fast. You guys know that. All of a sudden, they're 40 and whatever, and it's like everything changes. Noah won his family. Don't worry about winning anything else. Go win your family. Most important thing of all. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings, and thank you for a day we set aside. That not that It shouldn't be just one day, but thank you for our fathers, dear God. And thank you, dear Lord, uh, for our grandfathers. Many individuals here have been influenced, and their kids have been influenced greatly and loved greatly by their grandfathers as well, not just their dads. Thank you, dear Lord. I see the life of Noah, and I see how difficult it was to be that man during a very difficult time. And yet, he stayed with his family. He continued on his course and he communicated God's word, and he did it over a hundred years and kept preaching the same message. So, dear Lord, thank you so much for the privileges that you give us, the blessings that we have, and for the opportunities that lay before us. And, dear Lord, thank you so much. 
because we have the opportunity to be witnesses, to be witnesses of Christ Jesus, to be witnesses of your saving grace, to be witnesses of all that you do and all that you've done and all that you're going to do. So grateful. So grateful, dear Lord. Help us never to cease being grateful. We ask your blessing, dear Lord. We ask your guidance upon each and every one of our lives. And dear Lord, that we might do those things that are right in your sight, that we might walk with you, witness of you, and most of all, win our families. We thank you now, dear Lord. We bless your name. Thank you for the change of weather, even with the heat. It just reminds us that, Father, you are consistent and you keep your word. The weather changes, but your word doesn't. We ask your blessing now. We thank you. We bless you for all these things. And dear Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Do so in the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Also, uh, 22nd, 22nd, which is going to be not this Saturday, 